Good morning, Miss Rivers. Are you ready to go? Good morning, Dad. Yes, I'm ready. Excellent. Um, we are here. Uh, we have a client here. I understand. We'll get them out in a minute. Okay. I'm just letting folks know why we're here. And then uh, I promise we'll get Mr. McGuire here for all the substantive part of the hearing. Uh, but just a few procedural things. We're here for a bond hearing in a case with which many of us are quite familiar, as I recognize some faces in the gallery, lawyers and others. Um, courtroom 8D is a mask optional space. Um, I have about 900 vaccines jabbed into my arm, so I'm all right with it. I don't require people to take their masks off unless they will be speaking. If you are gonna be speaking, I do need you to remove your mask when you're speaking so that our court reporter who is appearing virtually can hear you all. Otherwise, it's personal choice while you're in 8D. Once you leave 8D, put the mask back on because there is a standing order that uh, more public spaces um, folks continue to mask up. Um, the other thing is I noticed there are some people on the Zoom call, which is great. They need to stay muted in less than until they're going to be speaking. If we get feedback or noise from folks who've joined the Zoom, I'll need to remove them. Um, and we are also live streaming this, so people who want to participate silently can always get the YouTube feed. With that, Mr. Samuel, good morning. Is there anything we need to talk about before we bring Mr. MacGyver up? Okay. Mr. Abate, will you be primarily addressing the issue or Ms. Patel? Uh, I will not. Okay, anything before we bring Mr. MacGyver out? No, Great, if we could bring him out, please. Are you able to hear us? Yes, I can hear. Great. Well, let's get on the record in case 17 SC 153902. It's State of Georgia versus Claude Lee, aka Tex MacGyver. And we are here today to discuss bond. Uh, Mr. MacGyver was convicted of felony murder and aggravated assault and a few other offenses. He was sentenced necessarily to a term of life in prison. That conviction, parts of his convictions were overturned on appeal by the Supreme Court. So we are back in a posture of Mr. MacGyver facing charges at least for aggravated assault and felony murder. Um, and we need to talk about getting ready for that trial, if it's gonna be a retrial, but more importantly, and specifically for today, I'm going to hear from Mr. MacGyver's lawyers about bond, and I will hear from the state about bond, and we'll go from there. So, when you're ready. Uh, Your Honor, you have uh, correctly recited the history of the case. Um, Mr. MacGyver is now facing, I believe, three counts. Uh, felony murder, aggravated assault, and possession of a firearm during the commission of the felony. You previously granted a direct verdict on the two influencing witness counts. He has fully served the third, which was affirmed, and of course, uh, Ballas murder, he was acquitted of. So we have three counts. You previously set bond for those three counts as well as all the others. Uh, to remind you, um, in an order dated January 16th, 2018, you set a bond of $100,000 for felony murder. $100,000 for aggravated assault, $20,000 for the firearm charge uh, under the 10% provision that, that Fulton County and the Sheriff's Office and the pretrial recognizes. So the, the total bond on those three counts, which are the only three counts remaining, uh, were $220,000. 10% would be, of course, $22,000. Um, he is in pretrial status at this point. Um, he is presumed innocent. I don't need to tell you, you know, kind of the basic rules of the road here. Um, we, um, you know, fully anticipate having a trial. I would, if I may point out that the Supreme Court decision noted the weakness of the case, describing it as thin and weak, I believe, were the two phrases it used. Uh, in finding uh, no harmless error from the uh, various issues that the Supreme Court found necessitated uh, a retrial, not just the, the um, uh, 
lesser included offense problem, which maybe some would view as being somewhat technical, but also the uh, what we you know decried throughout the course of trial the quote second will evidence and the uh, evidence regarding you know which hospital they drove to. All of that's now been ruled out. Um, and we think um, the defense case will result um, either in a directed verdict or uh, an acquittal. So um, he's now serving time for nothing that he's been convicted of. Uh, he served as you know every day of his five years for the influencing a witness charge, uh, which the Supreme Court affirmed. Uh, and we would ask you to set bond uh, in the amount of two hundred and twenty thousand dollars with an under the ten percent provision. Um, Ms. Clark Palmer, my partner, will address the, some of the conditions of bond that we propose. Um, I would just kind of preferentorily say uh, that we think very few conditions are necessary to assure his appearance. Uh, we will be ready for trial. We understand the prosecution has some dates in mind. I don't know how serious they are about that. Um, uh, but at any rate, we will be ready for trial when you're ready for trial, and the prosecution is ready for trial. Um, I, I, the only thing I would note is we've all got, you know, issues with Judge uh, Glanville, as you may know, and um, so we're going to have to figure out what's going on with his cases. Um, and, and other than that, this is an older case, so if we set it down for trial, take pressure. Yeah, you tell Judge Glanville that his 28 defendants, all of whom have been denied bond, um, are going to have to wait. But anyway, so that doesn't need to be... <laughs> Officially on the record, I know the court reporter's <laughs> writing late. it down. <laughs> Too late, is that what you said? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, anyways, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Clark Palmer to address any questions you have about what conditions would be appropriate in this case. Um, and um, thank you for your thoughts. Sure. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. We would like the court to allow Mr. McIver to live with his sister, Ms. Dixie Martin, who lives in Texas. And we could provide, if it's okay, we could put the address on the record. We'd rather not, if that's okay, we could provide it to the court, to the prosecution. If, if bond will be set and I think that that's the right location, I'll make sure to get that address. You don't okay. need to put it on. Telling me it's in Texas is important because that leads right. to some things I'm sure you're going to address because Texas is not Alpharetta Correct. or Smyrna. It's many states away. Yes. So since we were last in a pretrial st status, Mr. McIver, um, either he or people associated with the estate of Diane McIver have sold the condo that he was living in as well as the property that was in um, out by Lake Oconee. So he no longer has a residence here in Atlanta in which to live. He doesn't have any family members here to live with. That's why we're asking him asking you to allow him to go live with his sister in Texas, you know, recognizing it's um, not only out of state, but quite far away. She is here on the Zoom. Um, I will tell you, I, what I was gonna do is kind of lay out her living situation and then just ask her to verify that I've said it all correctly. She, Ms. Martin and her husband live there at their house. Um, I, she'll have to tell us how long they've been there, but it's been quite some time. They're both retired. Um, there's nobody else who lives in the house with them. There's room for Mr. McIver to stay until we get to trial. They know it could be, you know, for some period of time. Um, she has also verified that there's no firearms in the house and will be no firearms in the house. And she's available, you know, to help Mr. McIver. He needs to get to some doctor's appointments um, to uh, various, you know, just health providers that he has not had access to while he's been in custody. So he'd like to do that. We would like for him to be allowed to travel back here to Georgia, obviously for court, to meet with his lawyers. Um, he does need to come back. He doesn't have a place to live, but my understanding is there is like a storage unit here with some of his effects that he would like to, you know, go through and, and either keep or dispose of. We could provide, you know, pretrial with notice of any um, intended dates of travel and an itinerary. Um, so it would be come back to Georgia, one, for court, obviously, mm -hmm. but two, to deal with a storage unit? Yes, and, okay. to meet, and to meet with his lawyers. Okay. Yes, those would be the things we'd ask your honor to do. Um, could we hear from Ms. Martin now, or sure. do you want to wait? 
and let the state? No, 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 no. Okay. I mean, make your presentation, and okay. I'll, I'll certainly, you're the movement, so after we hear from the state, I'll turn back to you and Mr. Samuel to see if there's anything you want to okay. say in response. All right, Ms. Martin, uh, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Okay. And uh, did you hear what I just told the court about you and your husband and your living situation there? Yes. And did I recount it all accurately? Yes. Okay. And can you just tell us what city in Texas you reside in? We live in South Lake, Texas, which is north of Fort Worth and Dallas. And how long have you lived in the house that you live in? 13 years. Okay. And where you all live, is it like a, like a neighborhood or a subdivision? Yes. Okay. And you have verified there's no guns in your house and there will be no guns in your house if Mr. McIver comes to live with you, right? Correct. Okay. And you are available to help make arrangements or get him back to court if that is necessary. Is that right? Yes. Okay. All right. I don't have any other questions for Ms. Martin. Okay. The state may have some questions for you, so just hang on. Mr. Abate, any questions for Ms. Martin? Okay, Ms. Martin, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you, Judge. Judge, those are all the conditions that we're asking the court to impose. You know, I, I'm not sure about pretrial, how that works with supervising people who are out of state. I think they can do it, and obviously Mr. McIver will report to pretrial as required. Um, if there are any other conditions the court thinks are appropriate to impose, we'd obviously comply with those. Um, but everything I've just listed out is what we're asking the court to do in this case. Okay. Um, Ms. Jackson, um, can you share with us how pretrial supervision works if a defendant is authorized to be um, out of state? Or does it not work and, and it, there wouldn't meaningfully be pretrial supervision? And good morning. Um, good morning. Um, Yes, um, pre-trial can supervise someone that lives out of state. Currently, no one is reporting to the office, and everyone um, is communicating over the phone or either email. They may even have Zoom uh, meetings, but no one is reporting to the office, um, Your Honor. When you say no one, meaning if I were on supervision and I live here in Atlanta, I'm still only remotely connecting with the officer who's supervising the phone, Zoom, whatever it may be. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Judge. You bet. Mr. Bakken. Well, before, before you get, I assume there was no one else from whom you wanted me to hear. There, I noticed there might be a couple of other family members on, client is here, um, but you've shared what you want to share. Yes, that's right. They were, they were just here to observe and, and be supportive. Okay. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. Um, after receiving the bond motion from defense counsel as it pertains to uh, Mr. McIver, um, the state holds the position that Mr. McIver is not a good candidate for bond. Um, he sits before you in a very different position uh, than he sat before you, um, I believe it was June 6th of 2017, uh, at the last uh, bond motion or bond hearing uh, that Your Honor presided bef uh, before or over. Um, today he sits before you a convicted felon. And not only is he uh, a convicted felon, but he is a convicted felon of influencing a witness, specifically Miss Danny Jo Carter. And that conviction goes directly to the last Diala factor um, that the court is to consider uh, when uh, whether to grant uh, a bond or deny a bond. And um, because his conviction goes directly to that factor, it has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, and a, a jury accepted it and found Mr. Uh, McIver uh, guilty of influencing witnesses, specifically here, um, Miss Danny Jo Carter, in an attempt to get her to change her story or to tell the police that she wasn't driving the car, she wasn't there, and she had just come up um, to the hospital as support for both Mr. McIver and Mrs. McIver. I'd also bring to the court's uh, attention during the trial that you presided over, there was testimony um, of further uh, what I would classify um, that would go to uh, that this IOLA factor at 
intimidating or influencing witnesses. You heard testimony from Jeff Dickerson uh, that there was a request that he meet with the DA, uh, the former DA, Mr. Paul Howard, uh, to uh, provide a sum of money or, for lack of better words, pay off Mr. Howard not to move forward uh, with the case. You heard testimony from Tommy Lee Carter, um, and you heard the voicemail that Mr. McIver had left uh, Tommy uh, Lee Carter uh, saying that what Danny Joe was doing was, you know, explosive for Mr. McIver and she needed to stop. And that voicemail was made after Mr. McIver made several attempts, many attempts, many phone calls in order to connect or make contact uh, with Ms. Uh, Carter after she didn't show up uh, for a, a meeting that Mr. McIver had arranged with the media and uh, other members of uh, the media uh, and his counsel uh, in order to uh, say things that he wanted her to say, ultimately why uh, she uh, went to Mr. Cardwell's house and opted not to uh, speak with anyone related to Mr. McIver or any media related to uh, this uh, incident uh, in the, that led to the death of Diane McIver. Your Honor, I, I would also, um, based on the fact that Mr. McIver uh, sits before you uh, a convicted felon, um, and despite um, the fact that the Supreme Court has um, overturned the verdict, he sits before you found guilty by 12 members of this community who found him guilty of felony murder, aggravated assault, and uh, possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony, in addition to the influencing uh, a witness. He sits before you um, with very thin or slight ties to this jurisdiction, to this community, as um, was referenced uh, during defense counsel's uh, presentation. All of that, Your Honor, I would say um, also goes, or I'd submit to the court, goes to the fact that he is a risk of flight. Um, he doesn't have ties to this community that would bring him or uh, make him necessarily show up for court. Um, I would also bring to the court's attention, um, gently, but Mr. McIver is uh, older. He's 80 years old. Um, after being convicted of murder, I think it, it makes it to where he is less likely to return to court because he has less to lose. Um, he has less time to sit in custody if found guilty. Um, so I, I would bring that to the court's attention. Um, I'd also bring to the court's attention you heard not only during the trial, but through the numerous pretrial motions about Mr. McIver's history, his past, and his aggravated assault that occurred in DeKalb County, where he fired um, multiple times into a, a vehicle he believed to be suspicious um, that had three, at that time, young uh, gentlemen in it. Um, that ultimately did result in, um, I believe it was a diversion um, program over in DeKalb after Mr. McIver paid a sum of money uh, to the individuals uh, to make the, the incident or to make the victims whole and the incident go away. Um, you also heard about uh, Mr. McIver firing a uh, shotgun you know, from the uh, balcony of his uh, apartment or condo here in Buckhead um, at some uh, buzzard or bird um, where Mr. Uh, Rucker went, uh, I would say, for a, a long time during that hearing um, uh, about that uh, incident and um, how reckless um, that uh, was not only to uh, himself but to the uh, members of the community um, below him and around him um, at his condominium. So based upon all of that, Your Honor, I would respectfully request uh, that you deny defense counsel's motion for bond. I share the same sentiment um, as Mr. Samuels. Um, the state um, is ready to uh, move forward with this case and do so in a timely fashion, not one that is delayed or uh, belabored by any means. Um, and uh, I the state filed a couple months ago a motion especially set, and the um, state stands behind that and would respectfully request that this court uh, try this case um, in a timely fashion uh, as requested by both defense and uh, the state. Um, the state has several um, victim impact uh, witnesses who would like to um, make a statement to the court uh, when Your Honor deems appropriate. Now is appropriate. Okay. Your Honor, we may have, I can't remember if we dealt with this before, I was just looking at the statute under the definition of who qualifies under the Victim Rights Act, so I do have an objection 
but I don't think it fits the statutory definition. Okay, objection is noted. Who do you want me to hear from? Um, Your Honor, there are four statements. Uh, Mr. William or uh, Billy Corey would uh, uh, like to address the court, as well as um, Ms. Elaine Williams, uh, Ms. Dale Car Carwell, and Ms. Dana Jo Carter. Okay, go in whatever order you want, and um, we'll try to keep these as succinct as possible, but I think it's important for folks to be heard. It's an important issue. And uh, Mr. Corey um, is going to uh, go first. Would you like to attend at the podium or um, back here, Your Honor? So the court reporter will want folks at the podium just for audibility. Um, so if you don't mind helping folks one at a time get to the podium, that way Ms. Rivers will be able to hear specifically what's being said. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. shocked and saddened to learn the ruling by the Georgia Supreme Court overturning the murder and conviction of Tex MacGyver for the shooting death of Diane MacGyver. As, you're, as you may recall, Diane was a close friend and co-worker for many decades with me, as well as the life and, 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 and his, her, her death created uh, a void in my life and the lives of many others that worked for her. I remain steadfast in the belief that Diane's death was an intentional act predicated by Tex MacGyver. It is my firm belief that the Fulton County jury that heard the MacGyver case was correct in its unanimous decision to convict him for the crimes for which he was charged. I plead with this court to vigorously oppose the release of MacGyver, who after knowing him for many years, consider him a significant flight risk, considering in a part that he has never even given, saying he was sorry for killing Diane. Thank you, sir. Welcome. I appreciate it. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. My name is Dale Cardwell. Um, I was close to both Tex MacGyver and Diane MacGyver. I was shocked and saddened when she was killed. In fact, I called Tex and I offered my heartfelt condolences. Then I started observing Tex do abnormal things, and it took a significant amount of convincing for me to believe that he would have killed her intentionally. But I arrived at that conclusion because of a number of really, really uh, crazy acts on his part. But I know we're here, not here to talk about guilt or innocence, but whether he's a flight risk. So among those acts included uh, possessing a firearm in his condominium after it was clear that he should not have one. It included him uh, aggressively trying to influence Danny Jo Carter to the point that she and her husband felt that they needed to come to my home and hide from Tex and his attorneys because they were so aggressively trying to get Danny Jo to tell in a deposition Tex's side of the story. A Tex is a very, very bright gentleman, and he is very resourceful, and he has a lot of friends in a lot of influential places. And while I understand the circumstance of where he would stay, uh, being in Texas so near such a porous border would create such a temptation that I don't think that that would be a wise move. And finally, Tex uh, has the ability to to contact people and to manipulate situations. And if he is released on bond, I think his defense would be more than happy to offer delay after delay when the court, I believe, is charged with trying Mr. McIver within 180 days of the reversal. Um, and so 
In order to d deliver justice for Diane McIver, I believe that Mr. Uh, McIver should stay in custody. Okay. Thank, Thank you, sir. Mr. Cardwell. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. My name is Elaine Williams, E-L-E-I-N-E, W-I-L-L-I-M-S. -E I feel like I'm in class. I was told to spell my name. You did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm amazed also at the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Mr. MacGyver's murder conviction. Nevertheless, the way in which Diane was taken from us compels me to stand here today to oppose any sort of release of Mr. MacGyver. The freedom to live out her life was unfairly and intentionally taken from her, and the lasting rippling effect of her loss lingers daily. Not just in our office where she was so loved and respected and served as president, but even more as a very close friend and confidant. I so wanted to believe her death was an accident. However, the actions taken and shown by Mr. MacGyver proved otherwise. He showed no remorse, asking for her checkbook a day or two after her death, the immediate sale of her clothing and jewelry, seeking information on getting her social security benefits three days after her death, and the non-communication of her disposal, resting place, or even a simple celebration of the love, time he spent with her, or the so-called wonderful life they shared. In my belief, all show that Diane's death was an intentional act committed by Mr. MacGyver. Do you have a view on the elements I need to consider, which would be risk of flight or intimidating yes, witnesses? Do. You do, okay. I, do. I remain firmly in my belief that the 12 jurors selected by both the DA's office and the defense team representing Mr. MacGyver heard and reviewed all the evidence presented, made an honest, unanimous, and correct decision to convict as to the crime Mr. MacGyver was charged. Therefore, on behalf of myself and all of those lives who were changed forever that awful day, who to this day still have no closure, I strongly oppose and plead with this court to not grant this bond in the name of justice for Diane MacGyver. Judge McBurney, it was not love that killed Diane MacGyver, but one silver bullet and 12 pounds of pressure. I do believe that he is a flight risk. I do believe that he is an endanger to other people based on the actions that he showed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Okay. Hello again, Ms. Carter. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my statement's been kind of. Um, uh, some of it's been cut out, so I, I hope I don't stumble. Um, there are many things that I could tell you about how this man has impacted my life, but today is about the possibility for Bond. I can tell you that in December of 2016, when he was released the first time, two of the conditions of his Bond were to have no contact with me and to have no possession of firearms. Tex McGiver did make contact with me, coming into my salon and getting his hair cut, sending me notes by messenger. I didn't report this because at the time I was not sure that it was not an accident. His behavior became more bizarre to me and disturbing, calling my husband, telling me to stop talking to the police, that I was gonna have him put in prison. In the investigation by the district attorney's office, the Glock 19 was found in his sock drawer, but during a three-day hearing, um, he accused Billy Corey of having planted the gun in the condo. The gun was registered to tax his brother. His lying and manipulation resulted in the revocation of his bond and he spent the last eight months before trial in jail because he did not respect the conditions of his bond. His friends accused me of taking money from Billy Corey for my testimony. My testimony had nothing to do with his intentions or what was on his mind or in his heart. They were only the facts about what happened the days before, during, and after Diane's death. 
This is a fact. I am fearful of his release. I know he blames me and Billy Corey for his incarceration. This is a fact. He had no respect for the conditions of his bond the first time. I ask these questions. Why would he do so today? Why would you give the same man the opportunity to lie and manipulate? Thank you for this time. You're very welcome, Ms. Carter. Thank you for being here. Mr. Bate, anything else from the state? No, Your Honor, with all that, the state respectfully requests you deny the counsel's motion to bond um, as we believe that he is flightless and that he does risk uh, the intimidation or influencing of witnesses as he has done in the past and as he was convicted for. Um, so based upon all that, we respectfully request you deny the counsel's motion to bond. Okay. Um, Ms. Clark Palmer or Mr. Samuel, welcome to um, round things out as the movement. Um, at a minimum, I need you to further reorient me to those many years ago. I understood you to say, Mr. Samuel, in, in your opening comments, that um, at the time of trial, um, Mr. MacGyver was in fact on bond. Sure. So he had had his, I remember the bond revocation. I was there for that. Yeah. So he had had his bond revoked, and then at some point, it was reinstated? Correct. Okay. They, we had some hearings about that. What? Just I woke up one morning and signed a reinstatement, or what was the process that led to that, as best you remember? I think the reason that I don't have a very clear memory was before Ms. Clark Palmer and I joined the defense team, but he was out on bond during the trial. He was out on bond before the trial. The, I can't remember the first day of trial, but it was February or March, and the bond order was January 16th of 2018. That's when okay. you reinstated bond. Okay. And you signed this, and I've got a copy of it. I don't doubt you at all. You wouldn't have said it if it's not what the paperwork said. I just was wondering if it was the passage of time because we hadn't been able to get to trial, what it was. I remember why I revoked the bond. I remember that hearing very clearly. That's right. And the efforts of previous counsel to blame everyone else in Mr. MacGyver's life for the gun being in his sock drawer. Right. Didn't work out well. Did, that's right. But you reinstated Bond. So right. so you just obviously... Why. I'm sorry. I was just wondering why. <laughs> okay, well, I'm asking Mr. Samuel right now. I, if, he, if Mr. Abadi was there, maybe he could enlighten me too because okay. I, I believe it was before. I got in the case, Ms. Clark Palmer and I got in the case either mid or late December of 2017 or early 18. The order is January 8, 16, 2018. Um, I don't believe I was here for the bond reinstatement hearing. Amanda, do you remember? You would take credit for it, I'm sure, if you got the bond reinstated. <laughs> I believe that should not. My guess is that Mr. Harvey was clearly here because he was involved even earlier. He's, okay. he's in another courtroom today, so Sorry. couldn't avoid that. All right. If, if what do you remember, Mr. Bate, about why bond was reinstated? The bond was reinstated, but I believe the last bond hearing was the June 6th of 2017 hearing. Um, I believe it was 42 or 43 days after you had revoked the bond um, after the um, April 21st, 25th, and 26th, three days um, motion to revoke bond um, hearing where you actually did revoke the bond due to the circumstances. Um, at that point, uh, Mr. Rema Mr. MacGyver remained in custody. You had listened to a couple uh, jail calls, three being, um, I think one, Mr. MacGyver referencing, um, just call Judge Schwal and he'll get me out, two, um, was talking about uh, providing a, a Jaguar to Mr. Hughes because you know you've got to feed little birdies or something along those lines. And then um, the reason so he remained in custody, you, had, you kept your ruling uh, in abeyance, and then um, all the documents that uh, were seized from Mr. MacGyver's residences remained, I believe, in your jury room. And the taint team right. was trying to go through everything as, as, as fast as they could. It was a private firm Nelson and Mullins who um, was doing that and due to the voluminous amount of documents both sides needed an opportunity to um, fully go through it and argue about whether it was privilege not privilege and things of that nature so the trial was delayed um, and that's when after the trial was delayed you reinstated bond and I believe that's when both Mr. Harvey and uh, Mr. Samuels uh, took the place of Mr. I think it's Alex Barco and then um, and Judge Hill and Judge Hill yeah. and and I'm sorry if Thank you. Done. I'm realizing now this January 18th order amended the bond order to allow him to come to our office. So this isn't when he was readmitted, the January 2018 bond order. It was actually quite a bit earlier. 
Um, so, right. And I'm remembering that. It was the, the delay occasioned by the necessity of having a tank team to make sure that there weren't protected I recall materials, that privileged materials inadvertently disclosed to the state. And right. um, Nelson Mullen did its best to get through that, but it took long enough that it, it I viewed that as a state delay, not purposeful, necessary, mm -hmm. and that ought not to um, be a reason for Mr. MacGyver to stay in custody. And I believe you reinstated your bond originally, I think it was in October of 2017, because during the June um, bond motion after he had been revoked, Mr. Rucker had indicated to the court um, that the state uh, intended to have the trial sometime in September, I think it was September 18th, actually, of 2017. Um, but unfortunately, due to the delay of um, Nelson and Mullen having to go through and sit through all the documents that were seized to both his residence, um, that delayed the trial, and that's when um, a scene counsel uh, joined us. Okay. So, just so the record is clear, uh, Ms. Clark Palmer says that he was readmitted to bond in October of 17. So he was out for, you know, close to six months um, prior to trial. Whatever the cause was, he was out for six months, you, you know, and there was no flight, and there was no danger to the community during that period of time. Um, let, let me just, I don't think I need to respond to what some of the um, witnesses said. Obviously, they're displeased with the Supreme Court, but those of us who are, are members of the bar know that when the Supreme Court rules, we don't question, A, their wisdom, and second of all, it, it's meaningful, you know? I mean, it, I'm not going to sit here and brag about the practice of law about the Supreme Court, but they made findings which negated the conviction. And, and for the state, which did this in their pleading, to say, well, 12 people decided this case. And then the Supreme Court reverses it and said they decided it without having been properly instructed, hearing inadmissible evidence, more than one item, you know, the hospital evidence and the... And the um, Second will. Second will evidence, criticizing the prosecution for some of its, you know, at least close to being racial uh, evidence that was introduced, including the, the PowerPoint. You know, maybe you disagree with the Supreme Court's decision. I'm sure all the witnesses disagree, but that's, you know what, that's the way we practice law in this state and in this country. The Supreme Court said, in essence, and I, I may be overstating it somewhat, the trial was unfair. And that's why we get a new trial on, the, on these counts of the indictment. Uh, and that's meaningful. It means something. And um, I know you don't, to use a non-legal expression, poo-poo it. The prosecution apparently does. I mean, they repeat again today. Well, 12 people decided this case. Well, why did we bother appealing? Why does the state even bother participating in an appeal if the 12 people is all it takes um, to uh, lead this man who's now presumed innocent of every remaining charge in this case uh, to stay in jail. So um, I, I disagree with the prosecution's argument, and the witnesses, of course, are not lawyers, and I understand that they have an emotional um, tie to this case. Um, but for what it's worth, the jury acquitted him of malice murder. You know, I mean, if you want to talk about what the jury did, they acquitted him of malice murder, which is, makes it a very complicated verdict to try to, to unravel here. Uh, found him guilty of attempting, you know, intending to shoot, but not guilty of intending to kill. I mean, 12 jurors, if you want to talk about the jury's verdict, if it's meaningful at all, they found him that he didn't intend to shoot and, and kill uh, Ms. MacGyver. So uh, I, I don't put a whole lot of stock in that, but it certainly is contrary to what the states are arguing when they say, well, 12 people already found him guilty of murder. Um, and you directed a verdict on two counts. Um, the, the remaining count that, that, that was sustained, the Danny Joe Carter count, I'm sure you remember, we all remember it was a bizarre uh, set of facts where at the hospital within you know, 20 minutes of arriving at the hospital or with, you know, an hour of arriving at the hospital where he was in the back seat and the gun was in his possession and was shot. You know, and Danny Joe Carter is driving the car. He supposedly tells her, and the jury convicted him, 
you know, to tell them you weren't driving the car. Tell them you just showed up as if, you know, the car, you know, came in on, came in on a spaceship or something. It didn't make a lot of sense. It obviously was not a methodical effort to obstruct justice. Uh, even if you did say that, it's completely nonsensical, and I don't think it... Uh, and, and he has now served five years for that conduct. That one statement he served five years in prison for. Um, and I don't think that that is evidence of an intent to uh, influence witnesses in the future. Uh, if nothing else, the fact that he was convicted and served five years would strongly counsel against having any contact with any witnesses. With regard to many of the other incidents that were discussed by Mr. Boddy and by, by some of the witnesses, those were all known to the court and to the prosecution, uh, both in the fall of 2017 and in the winter of 2018, and you still admitted him to bond. Um, and, and obviously, you know, given the fact that the, the communications with Mr. Cardwell and Danny Joe Carter, had, Ms. Carter had already occurred, um, you found he was still not a flight risk and still not a danger to the community. Uh, and admitted him to bond, and he, he performed uh, without uh, any problem whatsoever after he was admitted to bond. He showed up for trial every day. He was on time uh, and certainly had no contact with any witnesses. So these episodes that occurred before have already been considered by the court when you, when you readmitted him to bond in the fall of 2017. Um, Mr. Abadi put some significance to the fact that he's uh, 80 years old. I'm not quite sure what the significance is of that. I don't, I don't know what that means, but uh, I can't even fathom how to respond to that. Yes, he's 80 years old. I would have said the same thing to you. I don't think that that makes him more of a flight risk because he's 80, uh, and, and it's, I don't understand how that would uh, influence the court's decision here. We think that the fact, the most important fact is at this point he is presumed innocent and um, he performed on bond after you released him in, in the fall of 2017. Um, he stands ready for trial, uh, and uh, we will be prepared for trial when you set it, and um, we think that conditions can easily be set uh, that respect the presumption of innocence as opposed to the presumption of guilt, which the prosecution is asking you to to, to influence your decision here today. And if you have questions about conditions. <laughs> That's your partner. That's my partner. Got it. Uh, can I just one moment? If, if the court um, thinks that for some reason that flight is, an, is something to even be considered at this point. Um, we checked ahead of time about getting an ankle monitor, uh, and he can get an ankle monitor, and we have a company that will, I don't know if it's a Georgia company, but it will do it in Texas, so, and pretrial has the ability to monitor ankle monitors in another state. Do I have that right? Yes. So, okay. I'm, I'm now the puppet, so. <laughs> You're doing a good job, apparently, because Ms. Clark Palmer didn't jump up again. All right. Thank you. I appreciate the input from all the perspectives, the people who were affected by what happened in this case, um, the lawyers, etc. cetera. Um, I'll start with agreeing with Mr. Samuels that um, we are guided by the Supreme Court's wisdom. We're also bound by the Supreme Court's wisdom. And they ruled what they ruled. Um, my evolving interpretation of the 100 plus page opinion that said it was a bad idea to rely on what seemed to be fairly clear cut Supreme Court precedents and deciding that the jury should not be charged on misdemeanor involuntary manslaughter um, is that even though a jury that decided that the lower level of culpability of recklessness, that it was an accident. A jury decided this was not an accident. Um, it was harmful error for the jury to not hear about an even lower level of culpability, as if that lower level would have somehow been a meaningful option for the jury. And the Supreme Court has said that it would have been meaningful for this jury, and it was error 
for the jury not to learn about an even lower level of culpability despite the fact that they rejected the medium level of culpability and concluded that the shooting was not an accident after hearing evidence and argument from the best lawyers in Georgia. But we remain bound and guided by the wisdom of the Supreme Court. Mr. MacGyver sits before me with a presumption of innocence as to the three remaining charges. He does not sit before me, though, as a blank slate or someone about whom I know nothing. Um, it was very helpful to be reminded why Bond was reinstated. Bond was revoked for an important reason. It was revoked because Mr. MacGyver demonstrated he was unwilling to comply with the conditions of Bond to include a very important one for his safety and the safety of others in a case that involved shooting someone. He had a gun again. Um, but I felt that it was necessary to uh, undo that decision when the state was unable or unwilling to proceed in a timely manner. Um, and that was more a recognition of Mr. MacGyver ought not to sit in custody because the state's not ready. Today, we have the state announcing it's ready, the state saying, please specially set this case. I also have before me a man who has heard a jury say, you are guilty of felony murder and will spend the rest of your natural life in jail. Not quite accurate. You'd be eligible for parole after 30 years, and you might outlive everyone's expectations and be around for a parole hearing, but effectively you were sentenced to jail for the rest of your life. I think it is reasonable and appropriate for me to consider that you, Mr. MacGyver, never ever want to hear that again. And the best way to do that is to not come back. The best way to do that is to have a bond where you are living in Texas and you can disappear. Um, you are a man of means. Mr. Samuel has represented men of means who, when they heard something not good about their case, disappeared to another country for years. Ankle monitors don't keep people around. I've had too many defendants cut their ankle monitors and disappear. I had a defendant, Mr. Harvey was represented, um, and he made it through about half the trial and didn't like where things were going. And we heard that that ankle monitor was heading southbound on 75 away from Atlanta, and then they found the ankle monitor on the side of the road. And that young man was a fugitive for three or four years, now spending the rest of his life in jail. You don't have to be a fugitive for very long to enjoy the rest of your life a free man. And that worries me. To me, that is a powerful incentive for you, Mr. MacGyver, not to come back to court to face much of the same evidence. I appreciate that some evidence has been excluded. I appreciate the observations of the Supreme Court that the case may have been weak or thin. Um, the state's going to need to work with what it has. The charges remain, and the state is ready to proceed. I don't find that there is a set of conditions that I could impose um, that would guarantee uh, or sufficiently assure me, Mr. MacGyver, that you will come to court for your trial, that while you are not in court, um, but awaiting trial, um, that you wouldn't revert to things I've seen in the past, whether it's being around guns. It's sort of ironic that the state you go to is Texas um, to not be around guns. I appreciate that your sister has no guns in her house at this time. Um, or that there wouldn't be a reversion to trying to contact witnesses to have them um, think about the case from your perspective. Um, you've got a track record with both of those things that remains before me properly. It uh, has nothing to do with the Supreme Court's ruling. Um, but most of all, uh, I am concerned about um, your willingness uh, to return to court for your trial. And so at this point, I am not going to set bond. However, um, as before, if there is any date that needs to be continued because the state says we're not ready, then I invite your lawyers to remind me, as I am sure they will, that um, I've drawn a pretty bright line that your detention is in part contingent on the state's readiness. And if they back away from that, then we need to revisit this. And the second thing I'll say is that it may well be that your team, uh, Mr. MacGyver, thought there would be a different outcome, and they may regroup and come up with a different set of conditions to include a location where you might live that is not many states away. 
Um, and I'm happy to revisit this, not in a day and not in a week, um, but uh, there may be a set of conditions that um, gives me the confidence that number one, you'll be in court when it's time to try this case again. And then number two, no guns and not contacting witnesses or folks who are connected with this case. But as of now, uh, I'm not comfortable that I could fashion a bond with a set of conditions that would um, allow me to um, have all those things occur. So um, with that, uh, I will circle back with the attorneys soon to figure out if we can set a trial date. Um, and that may also inform defense counsel as to how quickly they want to revisit questions of bond because trial next May is very different from trial in December. Um, I'll consult with my colleague down the hall about his case um, because I certainly don't want to interfere with that. My understanding is that he has the audacious goal of trying it in January um, and we'll see what happens. Um, but uh, I will coordinate with him and certainly keep the lawyers informed as to when um, we might next be able to move forward. Mr. Samuel, any questions about what I've just shared? No, Your Honor. Okay, <clears throat> Mr. Abate, anything from the state? No, Your Honor. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. We'll be in touch soon. I think, I mean, you've got a different one for the 2.30. Okay. And I've got one.